true church and false. We must carefully bear in mind, therefore, the marks outlined above, and weigh them according to God's judgment. For there is nothing that Satan contrives more to persuade us to than one of these two things, either to abolish or efface the true marks by which the church is known, and thus to blind us to any real distinction, or else to get us to despise them so as to turn us against the church, parting and alienating us from its fellowship. Through his cunning, it has happened that pure gospel preaching has been hidden for many a long year, and now, through the same wickedness, he strives to destroy the ministry which Jesus Christ has so appointed in his church that, if overthrown, the work of building up the church would perish. How dangerous is the temptation, or rather how ruinous, when in his heart a man decides to separate from a congregation which displays those signs which our Lord thought sufficient to identify his church. We see then how necessary it is for us to be vigilant on both counts, for to avoid being deceived by the title church, we must apply the test we have from God to any gathering which claims to be a church, just as gold is tested by a touchstone. If it respects the order which our Lord has set out in his word and sacraments, it will not deceive us, and we will be able safely to pay it the honour due to a church. Conversely, if it seeks to be acknowledged as a church apart from God's word and sacraments, we should be just as careful not to be deceived as we are to avoid acting recklessly in the other case.